I do want to bring you a little uh, glimpse of the global church. I've got my Ghanaian threads on today, and I'm showing you just a few slides of our time together in Seoul. We're grateful for your prayers, not just for the chaplain and me, but 23 student volunteers, seven trustees, half a dozen faculty, bunch of staff, and well over 100 alumni and parents from all over the world, gathered in Incheon, Seoul, South Korea for the fourth Lausanne Global Congress. And you might see a few people you recognize in these photos. With more than 5,000 delegates, we strategized about the urgent task of taking the gospel to every country and community, to every tribe and people group, to every person in the world who needs a savior. See if you can even imagine what it was like for us to worship every morning and evening with believers from more than 200 countries, all different colors and descriptions, many of them dressed in the distinctive clothing of their people groups. Lausanne 4 may have been the most globally representative gathering since the day of Pentecost, truly a foretaste of heaven, more globally representative even than the Olympics. Everywhere I went, I heard what a blessing it was to work with the Wheaton students who committed themselves 100% to serving the delegates. Your classmates crushed it. That's what I heard. And it made me a little, walk a little taller to get compliments about them and even prouder to meet Wheaton alumni living for Christ and his kingdom in Nepal, Costa Rica, Argentina, Malaysia, Japan, India, Bolivia, Tanzania, Albania, and to the ends of the earth. Our worship was living proof that the people of God are fulfilling the Great Commission. We are going into the world to preach the gospel. In the words of the Congress theme, declaring and displaying Christ to all nations together. And all the folks you're seeing here are, are Wheaton alumni. Now, we have so many reasons to get involved in the Great Commission. We do it because Jesus commanded it. That's reason enough. He said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. There you go. We do it because we love people who are spiritually lost, and we do not want them to die without Christ. We want them to live with Christ forever. And we do it because we want God to receive more glory, and that's what happens when people, more people worship him. And then we share the gospel for this reason, because it is part of God's plan for the second final coming of Jesus Christ. Listen to what Jesus said in the middle of maybe the most important speech anyone has ever given about the end times. You heard the first part of it this morning. This gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. If Jesus had been holding a microphone, which he wasn't, but if he had been, he would have dropped it right there. Uh, the chaplain likes to tell everyone where the amens go when he's preaching. This morning, I'm telling you where the mic drop goes. We preach the gospel to all nations. The world ends. That's it. <laughs> now, my theme uh, this year has been the end of the world. And every month, I'll be back to remind you that we are living between the first and second comings of the Lord Jesus Christ which means that the next main thing to happen in redemptive history is the glorious, personal, visible, triumphant return of Jesus Christ as King of all kings. Yes, sir. That's why the New Testament repeatedly tells us we are living in the later times, the end times, the last times. And it also gives us very good advice about how to live in these last days, specifically in Matthew 24, the primary responsibility of giving people the gospel. This mission critical chapter starts with the disciples behaving like tourists. It was the last week of our Savior's earthly ministry. They were in Jerusalem for Passover, and evidently they were very impressed by Herod's temple, truly one of the most stupendous structures from the ancient world. The disciples 
did what sightseers do, and they commented on the local architecture. Jesus was leaving. His disciples came to him. They pointed out to him the buildings of the temple. It was stunning. According to a common rabbinic saying, he who has not seen the temple of Herod has never seen a beautiful building. The massive stones were 10 by 12 by 40 feet. They weighed as much as five tons. You can almost imagine the disciples standing in front of them and taking selfies when they invited Jesus to come over and take a look. For his part, Jesus was not interested in playing the tourist. He had more important things on, mind. He, on his mind. He was getting closer to the cross. Yeah. You see these? Do you? He said, yes, he did see them. That's why they commented on them. But then Jesus said something totally astonishing. Truly, I say to you, there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. The temple looked like it would stand forever. But Jesus was emphatic. You, You notice the double negative. There will not be one stone that is not torn down. And once again, Jesus was confronting his disciples with something they struggled to understand. I wonder how many times they, they left a conversation with him and they walked away and they said, did you, did you hear what he said? I didn't get that at all. Did you get that? No, I didn't get it either. Together they walked down Mount Zion, across the Kidron Valley. They went up the Mount, Mount of Olives on the other side. They were still in view of this magnificent temple and they were still puzzling over what Jesus meant. It sounded important. So they had to ask, tell us, Jesus, when will these things be and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Notice an assumption they were making, an assumption which proved like most of the assumptions the disciples ever made to be mistaken. Jesus had not said anything yet about the end times. He had only stated that the temple would be torn down stone by stone. But as far as the disciples were concerned, the destruction of the house of God had to mean the end of the world. So when they asked, when will these things be and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the world, they thought they were asking one question, but that was an assumption. In fact, they were asking at least two questions, which we know, because although the Jerusalem temple was destroyed in 70 AD, we are still waiting, aren't we, for the end of the world. It's just a little warning here about how easy it is to misunderstand what God says about the future. Like the disciples, we're very capable of making wrong assumptions, asking questions about God's plans that we don't even really understand what the question is, let alone the answer. So we look at the conversation that follows, the the Olivet Discourse, as it is sometimes called, and noticing that Jesus is talking about more than one thing, the destruction of the temple. That's the starting point, but he takes that question as an opportunity to share what the disciples most needed and what we most need to know about the end of the world. It was relevant to their situation, but also relevant for the church at all times and in all places and never more relevant than today. Our Savior prophesies here about the destruction of Jerusalem, yes, but he also expands our vision across history to share signs of his second coming that are also signs of the end of the age. You can count these signs in different ways. Maybe we could say that there are 10 of them, and I'll mention them fairly briefly. First, false messiahs. People who say, I am the Christ, but are not the Christ, and therefore lead many people astray. There's only one true messiah, but there have been many false ones. That was true in the decades that followed. We know some of the names of the messianic pretenders in Israel, Thutis, Judas of Galilee, Simon Bar Kokhba. You may not recognize the name Sabatai Tzavi from the 17th century, but he was famous across Europe in the Middle East with thousands of followers who saw him to be the Messiah. In our own time, there are still people in New York City and other places who revere the late Rabbi Menachem Mendel Schneerson as King Moshiach. Jesus said, the more people claim to be the Messiah, the closer we are to the end of the world. Warfare. 
Another sign, verse 6, Jesus tells his disciples about wars and rumors of wars, nation rising against nation, kingdom against kingdom. And the apostles in their day, it was relevant to them. They were eyewitnesses to military conflicts. The Romans often at war, including in Israel. And things have only gotten worse since then. Can you really tell the story of human history without telling the stories of its wars? The 20th century, by far the bloodiest yet. The 21st century, is it going to be any more peaceable? Jesus was right. There will be wars. It's a sign, a sign of the second coming. There will be famines, too, and earthquakes in various places. Verse 7, signs 3 and 4. These human catastrophes and natural disasters, common in the ancient Mediterranean world and, and common ever since. These are signs of the end of the age, and nearly every region of the world has been affected. It started with the severe famine we read about in Acts chapter 11 and other places in the New Testament, but many famines across Europe in the Middle Ages, India in the 19th century, China and Russia and across Africa in the 20th century, right up to the present day, Haiti, Mali, Sudan. And everything that Jesus has said so far, all of that, as terrible as it is, is only the beginning of the birth pangs. It's not yet the full delivery. So add persecution as well as martyrdom, the fifth and sixth signs. And now the conversation is getting very personal and even more painful. Jesus tells his disciples they're going to deliver you up to tribulation. They're going to put you to death. You're going to be hated by all nations for my name's sake. Jesus mentioned martyrdom with his own crucifixion only days away. The next martyr after that didn't take long, just a matter of months, was Stephen. But he was not the last. Nearly all of the disciples that heard these words were also handed over and put to death violently, all of them except John. And there have been many martyrs throughout history. Some of our own beloved Wheaton alumni have been killed for the cause of Christ. Some of them are memorialized in the, the lobby of Edmund Chapel. I wonder if you've taken time to look at that plaque and learn more about Ed McCulley and Nate Saint and Jim Elliott. There's another famous martyr who will be honored this Thanksgiving with the release of a major film produced by 1987 Wheaton alumnus Todd Komernicki. It's a film on the life and death of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, yes, shot in the prison yard of a German concentration camp only hours before the end of World War II. These and countless others killed because of their Christian convictions. And we should never imagine that persecution is anything except a terrible calamity. One of the things we heard at the Lausanne Congress was testimonies of those who are, have, have suffered persecution in China, in Iran, in other places, in Nigeria. We do say that the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church, but Suffering also causes some so-called Christians to fall away and betray one another and hate one another. And this, too, is a sign pointing to the second coming, the betrayal of true Christians because they are Christians by so-called believers. Yes, sir. Last summer, I traveled to the Netherlands, and I felt like I was standing on, on holy ground outside the home of Corrie ten Boom. If you know her story, you know. She and her family uh, harbored for safekeeping countless Jews during the German occupation until the day when Corey was taken to a concentration camp along with her older sister and father who perished there. They were betrayed by family friends who claimed to be Christians. And Jesus was right about this as well. Some will betray their faith, betray their friends. They will hate the people of God. And not just some people, Jesus actually said, many people in the world will do this. It sets an expectation for discipleship. I was touched by the testimony of uh, one of the brothers at our little table at Lausanne. You gather with the same six people all through the Congress. He told us in light of his gospel witness on the borders of Nigeria and places visited and frequented by Boko Haram, he understood when he became a disciple of Jesus Christ, he was signing his own death warrant. Yes, sir. But that's really not any different than any believer. If we're ex receiving a call to live for Christ, we're also accepting the possibility of dying for Christ. And this is the condition of the church in the world as we wait for the coming of the Christ. Then false prophets will rise up, sign eight, They'll lead many people astray. 
These are not prophets claiming to be the Messiah. That was sign one. These are other prophets spreading other falsehoods, contradicting core tenets of the Christian faith, misleading people, causing them to doubt the word of God, dismissing our need for forgiveness, denying that Jesus is the only way to God. Many false prophets in the early church, Paul could hardly write a letter to anyone without confronting false prophecy and false teaching, and there have been many since. I wonder if the ninth sign is the most relatable. I'm calling it lovelessness that leads to lawlessness. Verse 12, because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. We were talking a bit about this last month. I was pointing to Paul's words to Timothy about the, the terrible times in the last days and the people, the things that people are going to love. They're going to love themselves. They're going to love their money. They're going to love their pleasures. They're not going to love God. Today, many people are concerned about global warming. Jesus looked to the end of the world. He was concerned about this kind of global cooling. Hearts growing so cold that they treat people unjustly. We see it everywhere around the world. We see it in society. It's a problem in the church as well. It's another sign of the coming of the end of the world. And maybe we see some of the warning signs in our own hearts. I wonder, in your relationship with Jesus, are you able to say that you're getting warmer or growing cooler? Jesus was concerned. The tenth and final sign is the destruction of Jerusalem, and we'll talk more about that next month. It's really the, the focus of the rest of this chapter. But I want you to notice this, that particularly about the first nine signs, they're all things that happened in the first century. The disciples saw all of them, and they continue to happen throughout history, and they keep happening today. These nine signs are not only relevant to the disciples, they have remained prevalent for all people in all places. And it's, it's really typical of biblical prophecies. Many of them have multiple fulfillments, sometimes separated by centuries. And the fact that we keep seeing these signs might mislead us into dismissing them. You keep seeing a sign for something, but it never happens, and eventually you start ignoring it. The signs of Jesus can be like that, like the pop-up warning. First time it shows up on your laptop, you freak out. Then you close it, nothing seems to happen, and you don't worry about it so much, right? The signs of Jesus can be like that. You see them, you see them again in the world, but are you paying attention? Are you giving heed to the warnings that Jesus gives? Obviously, these signs are not teaching us to look for something we've never witnessed. We keep seeing warfare, famine, persecution, injustice. So how should we think about the end of the world? What is Jesus calling us to do in the meantime? Thankfully, he doesn't just give us the signs, he gives us words of wisdom. Let me mention them very briefly. Don't get fooled. That's the first one. It's the first thing Jesus says even before he gives the signs. Now, I'm going to give you these signs, but let me just tell you right now, don't get fooled. See that no one leads you astray. So many people claim to have secret insight into the last times. It's one of the reasons I want to do this series this year, so we actually understand what Jesus does and doesn't say about the end of the world. Some people even think they can predict the end of the world, but don't get misled by wrong thinking about the end times. Rely on the signs Jesus gives and the promises he makes and also the warnings he offers. He also says, don't be afraid. That's a word of wisdom, which of course Jesus gives us because often We are afraid, not just about the end of the world, but also about all the little things that seem to us like the end of the world. Jesus says this in verse 6. He's talking about wars and rumors of wars, military conflict. What a terrible thing that is. We can hardly imagine if we haven't been through it. And we're seeing it today. Lebanon, Syria, Israel, Palestine, Russia, Ukraine, Bangladesh, Ethiopia, Sudan, Korea, Taiwan, Congo, Central African Republic, especially in Africa, Pakistan, Myanmar. It's more places than we have time to mention. And in every conflict, innocent people suffer not only death and destruction, but also moral and spiritual and psychological harms that can last a lifetime. Nevertheless, Jesus says, Don't be afraid. 
Indeed, he tells us that these things must take place before the world ends. It's, it's his way of reassuring us that God is still in control. Even with everything we see happening in the world, here's what one commentator says about it. In an atmosphere created by the horrors of war, a buzz with rumors of more wars, it's easy to get worried, thrown off balance. But there's no reason to be panicky about the world situation. God is in control. And all apparent triumphs of wrong will in the end be seen to fit into his perfect hand, plan. He's a God of justice and he will bring it to justice. The Savior who came into this world once himself to suffer and die is coming again to reign forever. He's got this the same way he has everything that we worry about well in hand. Don't get fooled. Don't be afraid. Don't grow cold. We've already said that. It's another word of wisdom for us. Many people will grow cold in the last days, but Jesus wants us to stay warm with his spirit, warm in his word, warm in prayer, warm in our love for him and care for one another. You might think that what we really need to know about the end of the world is when it's going to happen. Jesus is much more concerned about our spiritual well-being and he knew that thinking about the last days as a way of bringing out the crazy in all of us, it can lead us astray, it can make us afraid, it can leave us cold. But he knows what the future holds. He has it under control, so we follow him without fear. The signs he gives are meant to be faith builders, not fear producers. And then don't give up. Another thing we shouldn't do as we wait for the end of the world, and that is give up. Rather than giving up, we should persevere by the power and grace of God. As Jesus says in verse 13, the one who endures to the end will be saved. So no matter what else happens, no matter what else is happening in your life today, continue living for Christ with courage. That's always a word of wisdom. And to be very specific, don't give up preaching the gospel. Remember the mic drop at the beginning of this passage, or at the beginning of this message anyway, we, we see signs all around us that we're living in the last times, fires and floods, false prophets, international conflicts, all the rest of it. Maybe it does feel like the end of the world, but there is something that has to happen first. The gospel of the kingdom must be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations. Only then will the end come. The gospel made such rapid progress even in the first decades of the early church. It went from Jerusalem to Samaria to Ethiopia to Rome to Spain to India. In all of these places, people were hearing that Jesus died for their sins. They, they believed that he rose again to give them eternal life. They heard it because somebody proclaimed it, which is what must happen for anyone to be saved. Yes, it's important for us to live out our Christian testimony. It's hard for people to guess about the truths of the gospel. They need to be told, they need to be proclaimed, they need to be shared. And what the apostles did was really just the beginning. The world's not gonna end until the gospel of Christ and of his kingdom is proclaimed to all people everywhere. So we too are called to testify and to testify not just about what God has done in our lives, although that's, that's good to testify about, but specifically what God has done in Jesus Christ, his crucifixion, and resurrection, calling the nations to repent and believe. We do it by going. Who in this room will be called to go out and join the alumni that I met last week in proclaiming the gospel? Who will do the sending? Who will do the praying? Who will do the giving? Who will do the encouraging? Back in 1999, mission strategists determined that there were more than 3,000 tribes without any scripture in their, their own language. And they did some calculations at the rate we're going, how long is it going to take to get at least part of the Bible into all of these languages? They figured out it was gonna take until 2150. They said, no, there's no way. There's no way the church is gonna wait that long to get the gospel into every language. Situation has changed dramatically. That was in 1999. Today, at Lausanne, we learned at Lausanne, the number of people groups without an active translation project is down under 1,000. By God's grace, that task will be finished in your lifetime. What an exciting time to be alive. And our great commission is to take the good news of Jesus to every person in the entire world. Here's another estimate to think about. Lausanne estimates that unless things change, 
by which I mean this, unless we lay down our lives for the gospel. That's what I mean by things change, changing. 3.4 billion people who are alive today will die before anyone gets to them to tell them that Jesus died to forgive their sins and that by faith they can live forever. And more than anything else, this is why we can't get fooled or scared or grow cold or stop sharing the gospel. I was so encouraged this summer by the faithful testimony of Wheaton alumnus Julius Hagen. He grew up in Ghana, came to Wheaton, was called to preach the gospel in Belgium. And last summer, his church plant lost its home. People in the town complained. They kicked them out of the local retirement community where they very peaceably had been proclaiming the gospel, worshiping week by week. It seemed like such a huge setback. But Julius was undeterred. Here is what he wrote. We do not regret sharing the gospel of the saving grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we will not be stopped from proclaiming him as Lord over all to so many people in our town who do not have a relationship with this good shepherd, with this risen Lord. We continue to move forward with our evangelistic efforts, with spirit-enabled intensity through prayer, and we will continue to do so until we have filled Jerusalem, our Jerusalem, with the teaching in the name of Christ. We love our city, and we want to continue loving them into the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And that is our calling, to love people enough to give them the gospel. Father, we pray for the grace to do our own little part in the Great Commission. Lord, I, I think of our alumni, and it, it seems like more than a little part. You've used, you, you've used Wheaton College in a powerful way to proclaim the gospel of Jesus. Will you do it again, Lord, in another generation, a next generation? Will you do it until Jesus comes again? We pray that you will. In his name, amen. Let's stand to worship.